Being an inventor is like being in a race. Almost there. You think he's already... There is no much time. Eight laps to go. From Kansas. There is always competition. And you must be the first one. And it is going to be made to win the Kentucky Derby. And stakes can be as high as your own life. On Monday, the 16th of September, 1890, a man boarded a train headed from Dijon to Paris. The train arrived at the Gare de Lyon as it was scheduled, but the man did not. No matter how hard the police search the countryside between Dijon and Paris, there is no trace of him. He just vanished. His name was Louis Le Prince, and he was the man who shot the first motion picture film in history. Yes, not Lumiere, as many think. Le Prince's family was sure that he was killed by Edison's men, which is not a crazy thing to think, considering what was going on those days. It was a time when the idea of cinema was trying to get its execution, when new devices appeared in the United States, England and Europe. And, as is often the case with new inventions, no one fully understood where this all would lead. But everyone, no doubt, wanted to be the first. That was the goal to be the man. The man whom we will later call the father of cinema. One of cinema's greatest mysteries didn't take place on the screen. It happened off camera and at the very beginning of cinema history. This story is about Le Prince, the man who put everything into his invention, even his life. Louis Le Prince was born in an era that, for us, is probably hard to understand. Imagine the world without any kind of entertainment that we have now. I mean, now streaming platforms, Netflix, HBO, TV, podcasts, any kind of social media, YouTube, TikTok, all of it gone, not exist. You have theaters, books, which is not so bad, but also not so fun. We all need entertainment. And so did people in the first half of the 19th century. For that purpose, they had optical toys and magic lantern shows. Optical toys were a big part of the popular culture. The principle is simple, they all demonstrate the illusion of motion. Magic lantern shows were visual spectacles of images that you could see on a big screen, in special places, or even rent it and watch it in your own house. Yeah, just like Blu-ray or DVD. Also, people of that time just discovered one of the greatest inventions of all time. Photography. In 1825, French inventor Nicofor Niepce captured this. This is the oldest photograph that we know, so probably is the first one in history. So we have toys that basically demonstrate how motion picture works. We have a magic lantern that projects images on a big screen and photography. Combining this all together, we have a principle of motion picture film, right? But that's only easy to say. It would take decades to come up with this idea as a real possibility for realization. It may sound crazy, but the history of the cinema started because of the horse and a bat. In 1872, a railroad magnate and the former governor of California, Leland Stanford, made a bet. He was sure that during a particular moment in the trotting horse gate, all four legs were off the ground simultaneously. So he hired a British photographer, Edward Muybridge, to prove he was right. Muybridge at that time was a successful photographer on the West Coast. He was famous for his large-scale photos of the Yosemite Valley and others of the Western landscapes. To prove Leland's statement, Muybridge would have to take a series of photos of a horse on a move. So basically, to make an impossible possible. Cameras and film of that time were not suited to capture motion. They lacked a fast shutter, so photographers relied on the lens cap or even a hat to cover and uncover the lens. The film was hundreds of times less light sensitive than modern film, so for exposure it would take up to one minute on a bright day meaning the subject had to remain still for that entire time. Imagine that having all that, you have to take a series of pictures of an animal running at full speed. So 
Again, what Moebridge was planning to do was just impossible to make for that time. But still, he made it. Moebridge spent six years, over $50,000 of Stanford's money, to improve both – the camera shutter and the film emulsion. This 11-frame clip was shot on June 19, 1878, on Palo Alto stock farm. The place was owned by Leland Stanford and became an eventual site of Stanford University. Moebridge placed 12 cameras with triggered shutters in a line at appropriate intervals from each other. He also set up a white sheet on the background to reflect as much light as possible. The exposure was triggered electromagnetically using wires across the track. Now, can we say that these 11 shots is a movie? Actually, no, because what Moebridge did was more like a GIF. Which is great, we all like GIFs, but it's not a movie, right? After that, Moebridge focused on step-action series photography, later called chronophotography. It was a new field of research that used rapid photography to analyze the movements of humans, animals, or birds. But it was just a start. By the 1880s, there were many inventors trying to master the technology for what would become cinema. And not just in the United States. William Frisk Green in Britain, Etienne Jules Marais in France, the Skadanovsky brothers in Germany, and many others. The race to invent was on, and one of the runners was Louis Le Prince. Louis Augustin Le Prince was born in Metz, France. He studied chemistry and physics at university, but also had an interest in painting and photography. In 1866, he moved to England, being offered a job by his friend John Wheatley, the owner of an engineering firm in Leeds. There he married Elizabeth Wheatley, a sister of his employer and a talented artist. Together they started a school of applied art, named the Leeds Technical School of Art. In 1881, Le Prince with his family moved to New York. At first, he was supposed to work for his brother-in-law, but the business did not go well. Eventually, he ended up as a member of a French group of artists constructing panoramas. Panorama in the 19th century was one of the nearest equivalent to moving pictures. It was a huge painting that placed spectators in the center, providing a you are there effect. The audience could witness huge cities and great battles, often accompanied by music, sound, and lighting effects that simulate movement. Besides working on circled panoramas, Le Prince was fascinated by the early cinematic technologies that were developed by this time, so he started his own experiments. In 1886, he applied for an American patent for his creation, a 16-lens camera which took sequential photographs. Yes, that looks complicated. Okay, so just to put it straight, this was exceptionally early. In 1886, neither Edison in the United States, nor Lumiere's in France, made anything like that. Later, Edison wrote that in 1887, he had the idea that it was possible to devise an instrument which should do for the eye what the phonograph does for the ear. The idea. Le Prince at that time already had a first camera. I'm just saying. In 1887, he returned to Leeds to continue his experiments this time on a single-lens camera. And this is when things started to be weird. His wife later said that he had to return to Leeds because of the industrial spies from New York, who were trying to steal his ideas. It could sound like a conspiracy theory, but let's keep going with the story. In Leeds, he opened a workshop and a year later built one of the most groundbreaking inventions of early cinema. He called it a receiver, single-lens motion picture camera. It was fashioned from Honduras mahogany and weighed approximately 40 pounds. In October 1888, Augustin Le Prince shot several short sequences, what we'll later call the oldest or earliest surviving films. One of them is Round Hay Garden Scene. Yeah, it's super short, only two seconds long, and of course, silent. There were other films by Le Prince that survived till this day. Yes, they may look primitive to us, but please, try to keep in mind that it was the first test of new technology, and it was done way before the famous Lumiere brothers. But just capturing action is not enough. Now you need a device to show it to the people. So Le Prince started to experiment with projection techniques. 
On March 30 of 1890, Le Prince demonstrated his projector at the Opera House in Paris. Later this year, he decided that it was time to go back to the United States with his invention. He was planning to travel to New York to hold the first motion picture screening in history. But first, he wanted to visit his brother in Dijon. On Monday, September 16, 1890, after spending a weekend with his brother Albert, Le Prince boarded a train from Dijon to Paris. The train arrived at the appointed time at the Gare de Lyon, but Le Prince was not there. The last sighting of him was on board a train leaving the Dijon platform. After that, no one has seen him again. There are many theories for his disappearance. Some of them are pretty interesting. For example, there were suggestions that his family ordered him to move away because they discovered that he was gay. This is crazy because his family spent a lot of time and money trying to find him, and there were no evidence that Le Prince was homosexual. Another interesting theory suggested that Le Prince was the actual Jack the Ripper. No comment on that. So let's focus on the most reliable theories that have some evidence. In 1930, the grandson of Albert Le Prince said that the inventor was on the verge of bankruptcy. There was found some evidence that Louis Le Prince in true had debts of more than $80,000, a huge number for that time. So there were conclusions that facing debts, he decided to disappear and start a new life or even committed a suicide. The second theory assumes that Le Prince was killed and that the killer was his own brother, Albert. It is known that Albert was an executor of their mother's estate upon her death in 1887. Le Prince traveled to Dijon not only to visit his brother, but also to claim his share of the inheritance, which was worth about $140,000. What makes this theory even more interesting is that not even one passenger reported having seen Le Prince at the train station in Dijon, which is weird because he was 6 feet 4 inches. Hard to miss the man that tall. The only person who said that Le Prince was there and that he boarded the train was his brother Albert. Strangely enough, no one even questioned his testimony. So French police just believed Albert that he placed his brother on a train and never questioned his assertions. Family members disagree with both of these theories. Louis Le Prince was very close to his family. They had very loving relationships, so it's impossible that he could just leave them or that his brother could kill Louis for money. So what version did the family members adhere to? We know it from almost any film story. If there is a good guy, a protagonist, there is always a bad guy. In this case, the villain, an anti-hero, is Thomas Alva Edison. When Le Prince disappeared, his family, and especially his wife, believed that Edison had killed him to get his rival out of the way. At that time, there were several inventors in the United States, England, and Europe who were working on a film camera and projector, so the stakes were very high, especially for Edison. In 1890, right after Le Prince's disappearance, William Kennedy Dixon, one of the workers of Edison, built a motion picture camera and named it the Kinetograph, and even filmed his first experimental trial film, Monkey Shines No. 1. So, considering the timing, that really looks suspicious. At the same time, by law, not even a spouse can use a patent or invention for seven years unless the missing person returns or is proven deceased. It means that after the disappearance of Le Prince, his wife or children could not legally commercialize his inventions. During exact this period of time, Lumiere brothers projected their films for the first time in public and Edison started his projections. The only chance for Le Prince's family to prove their rights to invention was to sue Edison. But it was very hard to do because, come on, it's the Edison. Can you imagine how harsh were his lawyers? But after some time, they had that chance. Thomas Edison sued the American Mutoscope and Biograph Company, claiming that they had infringed on his patent for the Kinetograph movie camera. Funny enough, one of the members of Biograph Company was Dixon, the man who actually invented Edison's Kinetograph. Dixon left Edison because the latter had not given him adequate credit for his work. A patent lawsuit was a crucial moment for the Le Prince's family. His oldest son, Adolf, traveled the world collecting the evidence so that he could testify for the defense, American Mutoscope Company, against Edison, who was claiming that he was the inventor of motion picture camera, 
not the prince. But they lost the case. The prince's son, Adolf, was found shot in 1901 under mysterious circumstances on Fire Island, New York. The disappearance of Louis Le Prince remains mystery. He was officially declared dead in 1897. What happened after that? Well, in 1902, the United States Court of Appeals ruled that Edison did not invent the motion picture camera. The new ruling essentially disallowed Edison from establishing a monopoly on motion picture apparatus and ultimately on the making of films. After 1895, when they held their first public screening, the Lumiere brothers continued to shoot short films and demonstrated their cinematograph all over the world. The Lumieres shot more than 1,400 films, or actualities, films of everyday life, between 1895 and 1905. The world began to experience what would soon become one of the most exciting new industries known. Movies and group screenings became popular attractions in music halls, traveling fairs, and vaudeville houses in many countries. Owners of any sized indoor establishment were converting a building or room into movie theaters. That's how popular it became. And renovations of these new movie houses were a pretty simple task. All you needed is just sheet for the screen, rows of chairs, and some kind of a curtain to keep light out from the front door. Actually, this is when the term box office came up. It was from the use of a box for collecting admission. And there are films, of course. It was a period in the history of the cinema when everything was the first time. First comedy. The first film that was officially registered for copyright. The first known film with live recorded sound. First kiss on camera. First coronation and the first news event ever recorded. First horror. First pope captured on film. First science fiction film. In 1902, the first permanent movie houses started to open. By 1915, cinematography had spread everywhere in the world. Interestingly enough, Lumiere brothers were not part of it. Except for their experimental films and actualité, Lumiere's were not part of this boom that was appearing even in France. Louis Lumiere stated, the cinema is an invention without a future. And now we all know that he was wrong. But still. The Lumiere brothers are well known as fathers of cinema, not Louis Le Prince. If he hadn't disappeared then, he would probably show his invention in New York publicly, and the history of the cinema could be absolutely different than we have now. So someone can say that all he'd done was for nothing. Just imagine you made something, something absolutely incredible, but no one knows it. There was no point. But was it really not? You see, any filmmaker will tell you that it's impossible to make a film just by yourself. It's a collective work of art. You need someone who will write a story, film it, edit it, who will act, manage the light, sound, makeup, and all other details. And all that is made by people. Filmmaking is all about people, and each person matters. And it all started from the beginning. Yes, Le Prince built the first working camera, but he was using film invented by George Eastman. It was Edward Muybridge who made the first series of photographs. It was Leland Stanford who invested his money in an absolutely crazy project. And this list can go on and on. Just like at the end of a movie, there are a lot of names that we maybe never heard of. But thanks to these people, we have the most exciting entertainment and form of art that changed our lives. Well, I don't know about you, but for me, it does. Victor. What about us? You'll always have Paris. I said I would. 
I'm never leaving. Well, you never will. Where I'm going, you can't follow. What I've got to do, you can't be any part of. Someday you'll understand that. Do you mind if I ask you a personal question? You talking to me? I've seen things you people wouldn't believe.